Hey guys, we're back with uh, Mike Diamond, Adam Harvitt, and Amir Thompson. We're talking about Beastie Boys' story, which is on Apple Plus. I'm so happy it's out because we need content. We need things to watch. And we love you guys. And it's so fun to hear your story and how you evolved and changed and grew and became who you were. And uh, I, I just loved every second of it. Um, uh, yeah, Quest. I have one complaint about the movie, though. Oh, okay. okay. No, I'm in it 99.44% of the way. And I'm kind of glad you guys did what you did at the end with the Easter eggs with David Cross and Ben Stiller. Uh, I, I personally think that you two don't really bask in the glory of what is Paul's Boutique. And like, I know it's hard for you to brag and talk about like what an artistic achievement it was, but I, I just have to say that Paul's Boutique, Paul's Boutique really changed lives creatively. And I feel as though you guys don't give yourselves enough credit for that record. Mm. So my yeah. only slight complaint is the way that you kind of downplayed it like, oh, it didn't work. No, that, that record was everything. Even more yeah. than License to Ill, I feel that that record was, is your magnum opus. Like I taught college, I taught college about that record. So everything else after was just sort of like, no, no. Your your entire canon is amazing. We're, we can so be, you keep writing anthem yeah, after anthem, but I mean, like, it, it's crazy. But Paul's Boutique, I remember my dad brought it home from work. He stopped at Square Circle. That was the name of our record store in our mall. That your dad brought Paul's Boutique home? Well, yeah. I, I, beg, I asked him for it. I, I didn't have a car. I was in high school. So my dad stopped at the mall on the way home, and I gave him the money, and he That's brought nice it home. Plan. And, dude, it just kept folding and unfolding and unfolding. And it was like, I, it wasn't only an album for me. It was wallpaper. And I, I just like put it up like that was my in my bedroom. I was like, "What? This is the coolest thing in the world!" Like you, you hung it up as wallpaper. Yeah, yeah. I hung up their Rolling up Stone before. review. Right, that, that fold out. But we, all right. But can can I can I say can I say one thing though? Yes. A, thank you. Thank you for the compliment. But I guess I mean all we could do is tell our story within that and i think the way what, what our story in making paul's boutique is like we put everything you know in in uh since the nba season is not the season anymore I, i'll put it in basketball terms we left it all on the floor like we we put every idea that we had into that record every sample every everything that we thought was funny to each other and we you know it's like that thing where you work really hard on a record and you think it's dope you're like and that's when the word dope was big. Mm -hmm. Not so big anymore. But then, <laughs> uh, it'll, it'll pass. It's good. We thought, all right, we made this record that's, that's dope. And, you know, and like, and, and like we talk about in the show, we put it out and it's cricket. So our experience, so mean crickets being a term for when nobody gets it and nobody's on board. And then that, that so it, it's weird. It's funny to us that then years Later, there's a lot of people like yourself who love it and talk about how how it affected them. But it then changed their like, lives. And I are kind of like we're like, well, what? Wait, 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 why didn't you buy it when it came out then? Where but do like Where Prince Paul in 1980. No, but all right, Prince Paul. All right, so another thing, Paul's Boutique came out like we were really excited about it. We were working on this thing that we thought was kind of new and different. And we were getting ready to, uh, to put it out. And then De La Soul, Three Feet High and Rising came out. And we're like, oh, that's what we, we wanted to do. Yeah, well, not that's only that, cool. also Nation of Millions. Nation of Millions, too. Like, I remember specifically we were sitting in the studio and, and both those records came out while we were finishing up Paul's Boutique in the studio. And we heard those, too. And it's like, this, you know, you, Amir, you could probably relate to this, of like this moment where you, you love these records so much and you're thrilled and you love them and you're completely defeated at the same time. So we, did, we felt like there's no way, we were like, our ideas aren't gonna compare. I, I see Nation, Three Feet High, and Paul's Boutique as one life-changing three-headed monster. And I want you guys to own that you guys paradigm shifted creativity 
in hip hop. And yes, in real time, uh, Prince Paul like went on the record to say that's one of his favorite records. I've heard members of the Bomb Squad talk about it. Like those those million people that bought that record, they they changed their lives to that. Like me alone, that album like really made me want to create music. You know, when when Rolling Stone gave you all that Lee review. I hung that above my bed and read it every morning. You know, like people put post-its there. Like I wanted to create something so great and someone say words about what I created. Like I put that lead Rolling Stone review of you guys, that Axel Rose issue, I put that on my bed and read it every How morning. How do you remember all of this stuff? And do you have a picture of your bedroom from then? Because we need to put it up on you the You want thing. proof? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to see what your bedroom looked like. You remember that review? Because I'm certain that you were shocked that you got, when I read it, I graduated high school that week and my dad promised me like a leather jacket. So I'm in the mall and I went to the record store. I saw Axl Rose on the cover of Rolling Stone, looked at the review and was like, wait a minute. They gave him the lead review and a, wow, this is glowing. And I brought two copies, one so I can cut it out and I pasted it on my wall because like, I wanted, I knew one day I wanted to achieve something and have someone say exactly those words about what I achieved. Anyway, I didn't mean to take it over, but I'm just saying that you guys don't give your genius for Paul's Boutique enough credit. And I want yeah. you we'll, we'll think about that. We'll interflect on that. We'll take it. But I guess, what do you consider your best work? Do you, do you, you, you differ? Do your opinions differ? No, I mean, actually, uh, I, don't, I don't think, it's not that I think anything less of Paul's Boutique. Although, although I do remember the things that I, that, and Adam and I talk about this all the time, and probably Amir, probably the same for you. What we remember about our records are not the things that are good about them. It's like, oh, why do we have to put, like, there's a song on, um, wait, what's this song uh, on, on Paul's Boutique? It, what comes uh, around? What comes around? Like we clearly we should have left that song off. That. Well, every album has the a scatting gun. at the end. No the scatting? What's that? With the scatting no. at the end of the song. Scatting? Probably. You, you guys were scatting at the end of what goes around. Stars the big source. That meant everything to me. Like you think it's dumb, but maybe we had the scatting on, but not this. The song is a brick. It's a dud of a song. Yeah, well, I mean, you know. One man's dud is another man's life change. Like, what, I, I, I beg to differ. I'm, I'm swatting that shot. Time? What was the first time that you ever heard of the, of, like, of the Beastie Boys? Was it holding that hit it? Me? Yeah. No. Um, so at one point, Philadelphia was like the second biggest market for hip hop because there was only two markets. Yeah. Um, so Lady B made, uh, they made an edit of Parties Getting Rough and the Beastie Groove. Oh my God. So for me, when we heard that breakdown, and I want to know who's Bazooty. So when we made that breakdown and Mike D was like, Yo, just Bazooty, man, I don't even want to hear it. You just fessing. Like, fessing became that word that Philly tried to make happen in that way, like in Mean Girls that wouldn't work in any other ter territory. So Fish. they played Beastie Groove, Parties Getting Rough in Philly like it was a cut off a of thriller. Like we heard it all the time. Wow, that's it. I got that. Here it is right there. Damn, yo, you are a fan. Yeah, man, I listened to a couple of Beastie. I'm the, I'm the giant, dude, and I got, I got MCA and Bazzuti too. Drum machine. So, so I'm here. You want to know who Bazzuti is for real, or do you know who, who he is? Who is Bazzuti? Yes. He's Jay Burnett. He's an engineer, Burnett. and he engineered Planet Rock. <clears throat> Word. Yeah. Jay Burnett, like he he was an engineer for a lot of the, the big like uh, Arthur Baker, John Roby records, like whatever. Yeah, Planet Rock, ABC. I love you, all that type of. And we used to see him um, at this club. Do you remember the Latin Rascals? Latin Rascals, yeah. Latin Rascals. Yeah. Latin Rascals. Was he a member? No, no. No, Latin no, no. Were these okay. two kids that also worked under Arthur Baker. J. 
Jay Burnett was like this older guy who he'd like come from like kind of like new wave New York time, but was like the engineer that knew. And we would like Adam was saying we'd see him out at clubs and it was like we were like a fa you know we were kind of like what you're the guy who made Planet Rock, and then Rick Rubin. <clears throat> convince him to come in like I don't think it took that much convincing but to, to engineer that record but it was a studio Arthur Baker studio he would produce Jay Burnett engineer and Latin Rascals had their own room where they would do all those crazy edits and Yauk oh, worked there and yeah. Yauk was working just, there cleaning the windows and, and getting the snacks do yeah. did you think that rock hard was going to be like you that was going to be the jam that's going to take you over the edge that was going to be well. <laughs> I, we weren't even thinking like we're going over the edge. It wasn't even a thing like that. Like no bands, any bands that we loved and liked weren't like big ba bands necessarily. Do you know what I mean? Right. Right. We just hoped that it was going to like be the rap song that would put us in, in line with other rap groups. And like what Amir said, like it's funny. He's, like I, I actually was curious, like, like why was it that like Philly was the only other place like, it was, like hip hop lived in New York and it traveled to Philly. And then eventually it started to travel to like Virginia, North Carolina, like, a little bit, little bit further down the East Coast. But at the beginning, it really was something that, that originated, that, that would come out of studios in New York and, we'd, and, and rappers would make it about as far as Philadelphia, maybe Baltimore, and then <laughs> turn the hell around. <laughs> when, when was the last time that you guys actually, actually sang Paul Revere, like actually sang it. Cause I, I've been seeing you in tour since Check Your Head and you start to sing it, you go like, now, and then the crowd sings it to oh, you. Yeah. Right, well I see, that's the thing. It's a bona fide song, the crowd takes over. And actually to give, credit, to give credit where credit's due and Adam, I hope I'm not blowing you up, but I'm gonna blow Dougie Fresh up. Where I think we took that from was, there was a period like on raising when we we were opening for Run DMC on Raising Hell, and Dougie Fresh was on was on a couple of the shows, and yeah, you know, Run DMC where we learned so much from them. They were so great live. Jam Master J, hands down, one of the best live DJs for a band ever. Put the whole show together, but Dougie Fresh as a showman. I mean, he is a showman. He's you know he was when he and he would come out when he'd come out and do the show or like Lottie Dottie, the whole audience, the whole arena would sing every word. And he'd just beatbox, right? Yeah. We begged you to do it on tour. During, I think during Ill Communication Tour, I think just to be nice to us, you guys did it a few times, but like, I remember three or four times you actually doing it, but we call it Bobby Brown in it, where like, y'all sang. And then, like, you just let the audience take over. But they I mean, were, were in it together, like, right? Yes, there was one time where, like, <laughs> we did it completely on, on the ill communication tour that we did. I mean, how were we? Were we nice to you guys? Dude, you guys were, you know what? Okay, so in the beginning, we, you know, we were, like, green and all, like, oh, my God, we're going to tour with the Beastie Boys. So we had thoughts of who we thought you guys were going to be. and um. The first indication that you guys had really matured and that you were, you know, sage elder statesmen, we went to a spa, not a spa, I think we were just in the same hotel and Yauk was uh, in, in a sauna and me and Kamal went in with him. And, you know, he was like talking like a real mature and we, you know, Kamal and I were trying to figure out like, yo, where are the girls at? Where's, where's the beer? Where's the after party? And all the stuff that we thought that was gonna happen on this tour. And, um, you know, he was talking to us about like enlightenment and how his life has changed and all those things. And me and Kamal just looked at each other like, oh, wow, this isn't going to be a tour with girls and where's the run responsibility. It's going to be about responsibility and spirituality. But no, you guys were, you know what, when, when you guys would do gratitude, um, you guys taught me a lot about uh especially mario c uh about how the sound is important in concert so if you remember that tour in ill communication you guys did 
quadraphonic sound. Mm -hmm. And that's where like, for those that don't know, quadraphonic is not only left and right speakers, but even behind in the audience, there's four speakers. And you guys had a really clever joystick like device that would have like the swirling sound um, behind us and whatever. And I think at some point, Mario like let me handle like all the echoes and all the all the uh, the quadraphonic stuff. So when it was time for gratitude, and Yauk would do that long bass solo at the beginning, right before he got into the dun, 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 dun. like he let me do that. And Mike, you taught me. I didn't know Mike used to always uh, DJ records before the show started, and I asked like, wait, why would you give it away? Like, why would you come out in the audience and DJ? And he explained to me that. Like, there's diehards that are there standing on their feet since like 6 p.m. And you can't trust the sound guy to just, you know, before that, like the sound guy would just put on anything. It could be like Conway Twitty or, you know, Tom T. Hall or whatever. <laughs> and to him, Mike said, like, it's important that we, you know, curate the music and get people in a certain mood. And then I was like, oh, so I could do that. So then I started, I, I too started DJing before the shows and then after the shows. Like, so really like Mike, you're a big reason why my DJ obsession is, or my curating obsession is to that level. Even for the Fallon show, like I curate the music that comes in when people come in. Cause you taught me how important that was. I learned a lot on that show. But it's funny, but I, <clears throat> I learned it from just being a kid and going to shows cause I, seeing bands I love and then exactly what I said that hearing the sound man playing Phil Collins no disrespect I know you know no Bones, Collins slander no Bones Thugs love that's why I said Tom T. Hall <laughs> Wait, it was like always like Phil Collins or Sting right right like, those are records that like sound men listen to mm -hmm. <clears throat> and like I'm a kid I'm excited to see these bands and like why are you doing this to me? Why are you, why are you ruining my high right now by blasting? I, you know what? I even once convinced Jay-Z. At first, a, a, another idea you guys did, when you guys used to do your encores in like the nosebleed section, mm -hmm. the last time I did a show with... Was that, uh, I was curated, that was the next tour? Was that El Communication? No, that was the next tour. Well, the that. next show, right. But I was trying to tell Jay-Z, like, you know, okay, so we, we did a show at... at, uh, at Carnegie Hall. It was like one of those special, like, let's uh, everyone wear suits or whatever. And I say, yo, you need a, you need a down to earth moment. That's not for like the $10,000 seaters in the front. You got to connect with your fans up top or in the hallway or whatever. And at first I was like, dog, man, even the beastie boys do their joints. Like in, in the nosebleed section, you got to do something to connect with those fans up there. Those are your real fans. And once yeah, I said that, what does that mean? Beastie boys did that. And then he he did it. Him and Just Blaze would do their encore, like way up in the nosebleed in the hall. Hey, Rock, you don't you, you don't know the nosebleed seats? What's oh. what's up? My nose is bleeding. No, you don't know what the nosebleed seats are. <laughs> yeah, I know what they are. I don't know as well. He, he said, he said even the Beastie even Boys do it. I was like, what, what does that mean? No, it was like <laughs> that. That I think, but that's what that's what pushed him over. I said, yo, the Beastie Boys do that. Oh, I'm okay. sorry, Jimmy. It's all right. <laughs> and he was like, okay, word. And he did it. So meaning that I think he respected the fact that this was dumb, you know, like that has been proven that it could work. That sort of thing. But yeah. Were you guys nervous? Do you want to talk about Scrabble now or should we just not? Oh, man, I knew you were going to do that. Yes, it, it, uh, Jimmy, you don't know, but at one point- talk Scrabble, I, I want to hear about Scrabble, but I have to get my power cord. I'm back in literally 10 seconds. But you guys oh, you're like in, in point, uh, you're like 3% battery right now? No, power cord, it's an exercise he does. I got the- oh, okay. <laughs> Jimmy, you don't know this, but Ad, uh, Adam and I, uh, we're, we're, we're occasional online Scrabble buddies. And then he would destroy me, and then I just, you know, I, I couldn't spell quagmire on a, on a triple letter word, so. <laughs> I, I feel like Za kind of changed the whole game of Scrabble. Uh, Amir, thank you for uh, 
point in acknowledging all that out. I appreciate it. It's been documented. <laughs> I'm good at Scrabble. You're you're excellent at Scrabble. We we gotta bring it back, man. I know. I know. Do you do Scrabble, Scrabble in person though, please? In person. One of these Yeah, days. exactly. That's the next thing. What what are you doing right now to, to uh, spend the time while, while you're at home, Adam? Freaking out. Yeah. Are, are, are you really? my hands. Yeah. How about you? Same thing. Uh, wash my hands. But we're doing the show uh, just so people can uh, get, get something else besides just the news, you know, just to give people an option. It's good. It's good. Thank you for doing it. No, I'm happy that you guys you guys are doing it too. Uh, but there's all right, Mike's coming back now. I'm back. Oh, was there power cord? I don't have that notice anymore. Um, when you guys did uh, went from the party frat uh, music to kind of just your own brand and your own head, were you nervous that that was not going to work? Did anyone tell you like, dude, don't do that? Do give me another five for your right. Well, not really. I mean, it's a long, long story, but we, we were on Def Jam Records and things, you know, fell apart with Between Us and Them. And uh, I, I think that they really, or Russell Simmons, you know, and, and them really wanted us to just be the Fight for Right to Party guys. And we kind of just had moved on from that and wanted to do something different and things all fell apart. And so um, we, we left New York even, we, and we, we split up and then we, um, we, we started signing to Capitol Records. And I guess say Capitol Records has always been really cool to us th this whole, throughout all of it. They've, they've let us do what we've yeah. done pretty great. Yeah, well, we were like the weird stone guys. So Capitol was like, all right, you guys think and then with the beginning with Paul Boutique, they were like, all right, well, license ill is this big thing. So we need to let them do what they're going to do. And hopefully it'll be as big as license to ill was. And then that didn't happen. <laughs> then it was crickets. And then it was like, we went from being like, then it was like, everybody wanted to leave us alone because it was like, nobody wanted their name attached to Beastie Boys because then it was going to be like, oh, then I'm working. Here's with got a question. I have, I, have, I have one question. Okay, so knowing that the producers that you worked with had the ability to make those pop hits because they also made like Wild Thing and Funky Cold Medina, did you guys have the options to have either of those songs first or? No. No, actually, that's a good, that's a good question, but the Funky Cold Medina, I'm, I'm trying to remember, I feel like First off, well, two things. When when we when the Just Brothers first played us a cassette One. things, and they played it for to give Adam props, they played it for Adam before they played it for Yalkimi. But they played a cassette of what went on to become Car Thief and um, um, Shake It Rough, like so. That, so basically, the instrumentals of like the bulk of the music that's in Car Thief and Shake It Rough from Paul's Boutique they at like a party just played a cassette with that and it was that blew our minds like that was like wait this is what we want to be making and then it was kind of like then so then then we started working with them and they were like oh yeah we're, we did this song for this guy like tone loke that was like wild thing or we oh yeah we get this other thing bust a move and it was kind of like we were like oh that's all right like we we weren't interested in those songs honestly but okay. it was like okay fine you guys go do that but we want to make that like we want to make the that we heard on that cassette okay were you guys ever bummed out that you weren't on delicious vinyl no because we we i mean you know it's funny it's like a weird thing like with def jam that was a really really exciting time to be real about it. like not it was like that that thing of we're working with russell and russell introduces us to his brother Joe's run from Run DMC. We get to see Run DMC record. Like LL was like there. Adam like plays Rick the LL Cool J uh, demo tape. You know, and and Rick was like kind of was part of the band. You know, that was always like it was like this exciting, really really exciting time where we all thought we are part of something. Um, 
So, you know, that's what's hard. That's, I think that's one of the reasons we left New York was that we just felt so dejected. Like Rick had already bounced out to do his own. He felt he wanted to kind of produce and do his own thing. And like, so him and Russell had already split. Rick was out of there. And then, <clears throat> so then Russell's still there. And Russell's like, he no longer has the, the producer that works with us. So he's like, well, you guys got to go and make the record just like what you made before. Because, you know, Russell wanted to make money. And that, that probably would have made him, you know, or at least in his mind, the most money right then. Well, I mean, technically, I mean, not to, not to open a can of worms, but a lot of the high-end creative ideas from Ill were actually from you guys in the first place, correct? I think a lot of the ideas were from like Paul Revere was from you guys, like yeah, Paul, Paul Revere. That that whole thing of Adam had the beat in the eight hundred eight drum machine, and it was Yauk who said, "Let's but had the had this idea of flipping the tape machine over because right. Yauk, like we like Adam mentioned earlier, he was the assistant engineer. He knew like some technical things, and he was somehow in a in a in a time pre internet." he was obsessed like he knew all these Jimi hendrix tricks like which adam and i talk about this all the time or we were talking about it a lot when we were doing this show that became the the film like how did you know these things back in 1980 whatever mm -hmm. you know but he was a guy who said oh no this is what Jimi hendrix said we're gonna flip the tape over and then actually it was run Joe run from Run DMC when he heard that beat, like he came running up the block and he had the the intro. He wrote that intro for right. uh, Paul Revere. Jimmy, yeah. When Run did our show, that he still like that's our that's our bonding. When when Run did our our show when he did uh subway show when he did when he did freestyling with the roots with us yeah that's the last thing we talked about like his favorite story of all time is the moment he first heard Paul Revere. And what was it? He just, he, it, it was like, it was like him discovering gold. Like he just, I think that the portals of his, of, of the creative side of his brain just open. Like, wait a minute, you can, you can reverse a drum machine and make creative noises this way too. Like he said it was the greatest moment he heard. It was the greatest thing he ever heard in his life. Wow. Um, I, I want to talk about quickly uh, the, the documentary. The, the, is it a documentary? What do, you, what do you call this? A story? Live documentary. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, basically, it, it takes a really uh, uh, very uh, emotional turn when you start to talk about Yauk. And I understand that, obviously, you guys, I can't even imagine um, losing your friend, like, you know, uh, where you had your whole career together since you guys were kids but uh uh you, you talk about the line that he wrote in sure shot and how much that kind of uh it wasn't that big of a deal when he wrote it right no well what we were saying was <clears throat> at the time when we were recording the song and the record and everything we just would we would always just write our own lyrics and then just say a couple and the next person would say a couple and we just sort of would get feedback from each other how what we thought and most of the time it was just sort of like okay I'll, I'm going next and so when Yao said a specific line <clears throat> it wasn't a big deal but when we wrote this book and put the book out we started doing interviews for it and and almost every person asked us about these feminist lines that Yao wrote in a song 20 whatever years ago yeah uh, I, 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 I guess I, that meant something to Spike to Spike Jones because he wanted to, you know, to, that was important to him to put in the movie and to discuss. Transformations. Yep, that's exactly right. Uh, do you think uh, sense of humor, I want to say, is probably one of my favorite things about Beastie Boys. Uh, you guys always were either ahead of the joke or just understood comedy. Uh, you guys worked with a director called uh, Nathaniel Hornblower. Yauk's uncle, yeah. Oh, I, sorry, I forgot they were related. And uh, when when he jumped up on stage, I don't know if you guys re remember this, but for... Um, oh, yeah. He couldn't, how can you forget? He didn't jump up on stage. We were all backstage, so he just walked. 
decided. Dude, I would say but he, he could he could he jump if he wanted though, yeah. He bum rushed the stage though. He 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 just bum rushed. He just he ran out there. Okay. Sorry. All in the I interrupted. We are in the we are about to actually play um at that award show. Yeah, and, and he was backstage and he ran out and he did, was Michael Stipe was he surprised? Yeah, he yeah it's actually it? It's great in our film when you watch it. Still, I still enjoy watching how Michael Stipe's reaction to Hornblower when Hornblower blows up the spot and bum rushes his whole the whole situation. Because Stipe's kind of like trying to be cool with it, but he's not really cool with it. And then he doesn't know, like, is he supposed to be cool with it or is it part of the show? And he doesn't <laughs> just know. But I'm glad that he got out that he... But had the ideas for Star Wars and everything. Yeah. Everything. Everything. That's funny. I remember that interruption, but I never remember R.E.M. winning for Everybody Hurts. So yeah, I remember mind, that. And then Michael Stipe had like a My mind sabotage still won video of the year. <laughs> yeah. Uh, guys, I appreciate you taking all this time to talk to us. You know, uh, we, we love you. Uh, I, I'm speaking for Quest. I, I'm assuming you love them. Uh, uh, but we, we guys, <laughs> yeah, think about it. Uh, mm -hmm. Got a Beastie Boys story this Friday on Apple. Uh, check out the book, check out the Audible, and uh, pick up all the records. They're just the greatest. We love you guys. Uh, you know, you guys are our favorites. Uh, thank you so much for this, especially during this time. Um, I know we asked everybody if they have a charity that they want to mention, and uh, you guys chose Food Bank of New York City. Yeah. Um, so we'll put up the uh, the the uh, website for that. The smallest amount feeds goes a long, long way. Thank you guys so much for doing this. Thanks for doing it. Thanks for having us. So nice Bye to guys. see you guys. Yeah. Thanks, Quest. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone. See you. See you later. Bye. Bye. <laughs> uh -huh. it's on and on and on. Uh, I said. And it's on and on and on